with the record button here. So um, we uh, we agreed that uh, it's a small but really good uh, audience today here, uh, our community friends. So uh, before we present the topic of today, let's do a brief round of introduction. Everybody says uh, hi and uh, name and uh, and uh, a couple of words about um, how you find the Educate for Life Sprint and also maybe a few key questions already now or save them for later. <laughs> so uh, why don't we ask uh, Justina to go first? <clears throat> And you're muted, Justina. Just... All right. Tak. Yeah. Thank you, Lars. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hello, um, everyone. Um, I'm Justina Pietrzak. I'm calling from Brussels, uh, Belgium. Uh, I'm an excited and exciting member of the Educate for Life uh, uh, Sprint. Uh, really taking and learning so much out of it. Um, currently, um, uh, recently, we, I jumped out of uh, the group that I've been following and uh, decided to go for it with uh, an idea that was uh, lingering in my in my mind in my life for a long time right now, and I'm uh, I'm really making it with with a book on social emo social emotional regulation for children um, under the. Um, the uh, MPT of empowering the children to become the Zen masters of their lives. I'm um, um, looking forward to see uh, where this adventure takes us and I'm happy to see the rest of you guys. Hello, nice to see you again. <laughs> Good to, to have you, you here. Dina. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, an excited Olga? and exciting member. That's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Alka, welcome. Good to have Hi. you. Good, how are you? It's been a long time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, this is Olga Calvache. I'm an exo coach. Um, I joined the spring mostly as an observer, and I've been following the teams, doing all of the initiatives. I went to the disruption. I've tried to catch up well in these amazing meetings. I'm so um, grateful to have you, Lars, join this. Innovative ideas and learning a lot about everything. Uh, education is one of my passions, and I would love to see what you have to share with us regarding IoT and artificial intelligence in, in regards. Because I've I've read a lot, but there is never enough to learn about this. <laughs> so, <Understand. yeah. laughs> wonderful. Welcome, Olga. Great to have Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice, yes. nice to meet you too. And next up, uh, how about Lily? How are you, Lily? Hi. Okay, I'm turning my video. Wait a minute, please. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, hi. There you are. hi. How are you guys? Very good, I'm, thank you. I'm Liliana. I am from Colombia, Medellin. I work at a university. And I'm working, I'm joining Educate for Life with three of my colleagues here in the university. And I'm very passionate also as Olga about education, but especially education using technology. So I've spent my last 10 years working in online education, applying all technology in the learning environments. And I'm really excited. I'm learning a lot in this sprint. And I've worked really hard to keep up with all of the information shared in the platform. Wonderful to have you here, Lily, and, and your team. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm doing ladies first here, as you can tell already. So Esther, can, can you hear me? Hello, yes, I can. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. You do. I am currently traveling, so I'm just about managing the calls. Um, so okay. I'm sorry for coming in late. Are we doing introductions? Yes, we're just doing a quick round of introduction. So okay. it's, and it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am tuned in from India. I am currently traveling. 
uh, going for a yoga vacation, which I'm super excited about. Um, and I am mostly working in the space of education as well. My, I think what I really want to do with it is make education more accessible in India uh, because I find with as much intervention that still is happening, um, there's so many people who just don't have access to it. So sometimes I feel like a lot of the things that we're talking about in the sprint um, seem to be step two, three, four. Um, and there's a lot to do just to cover step one here. So I think that's where I'm starting to focus. Um, yeah. And that's me for now, since we're doing it quick. Good, good to see you, Ishta. Nice to meet you. And uh, welcome, Gabriel. Would you like to introduce yourself next? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Gabriel. I'm originally from Argentina, uh, based in Miami, I'm living in Miami, and now actually this week in Argentina, Buenos Aires. So kind of going back and forth from Miami to Buenos Aires. Uh, I joined uh, the Educated for Life community since I'm part of the Open Exo community too. So I heard about this project and I found it very interesting. Uh, I'll, I'm passionate about education as most of the members here. I, I work on the education field, mainly on the corporate training side of the education. Uh, and we are working with a group here that our MTP is to accelerate adult lifelong learning. And we are focusing on, on SMEs as a way of achieving that. So we, we are founding uh, so much on really good and incredible information to, put, to build this project, to build our project. And we are very excited about the things that are coming. So very excited now to keep incorporating new things. Wonderful. Good to have you. April. Nice to meet you. And uh, another uh, proud member of the same amazing team is uh, Peter. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Hello to everyone. And uh, thank you, Lars. It seems that you're going by age, and therefore I am at the very last of the introductions here. And that no. is okay. No. But, no. but, <laughs> um, to uh, follow up on Gabriel's uh, presentation, it's correct that we focus on uh, adult lifelong learning and in particular in SMEs where we see that there is an underserved segment because particularly the incumbent SMEs, they do not train their employees very often and that there is a big societal risk and there's loss of uh, wealth production also. So that's what we'd like to, to focus on. This is an area I've worked with the last 15 years, uh, incumbent SMEs. So therefore to me, it's very close to my heart so that we start getting something done in this area. So this is a remarkable, also a good uh, venue point to meet others who are interested in ed tech and in training. And perhaps we can cross fertilize some good ideas here. We certainly look forward to that. Thank you. Absolutely. We certainly have the opportunity to do that. It's all about just doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Let me just uh, briefly do a quick status on where we are in the sprint process. I think that can be helpful for everybody just for context. And then we'll get started on today's uh, topic. Um, we are actually over halfway uh, into the 12 week sprint uh, and um, we have come now to the exciting stage which we call the solve stage and solve <clears throat> including it includes uh, the, the first low fidelity prototyping uh, to validate the, the key hypothesis that each of the teams have behind their great ideas uh, so obviously it's important for us to test and learn whether the market uh, sees the same need for these good ideas and the services uh, that will evolve. Um, are, they, are they willing to use the services or products? Are they willing to pay for them and all? This? That's a lot that we have to learn at this stage in the sprint. And also when it comes to technologies, 
uh, and, and many of the, the amazing people on this call and also the ones not on the call today uh, are talking a lot about uh, different emerging technologies that probably are going to play a key role somehow in some of these new initiatives. And AI and IoT are often mentioned as technologies that can, can or will play a key role in many of these ideas. Um, at the same time, I think we need to be realistic around our own ex experience level and knowledge level around these technologies. At the end of the day, how much do we really know about these technologies and how do we get started uh, understanding how we can play with these technologies, how we can bring them into play here. Um, so how do we get started? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and some may have a lot of experience without me knowing it specifically. I certainly don't have a lot of experience actually. Uh, I mainly just talk about it. And I, I, I think I speak for many when I say we, we need uh, probably a good introduction uh, to these technologies and how we can start experimenting with them in, in the context of education. And so I was looking through our amazing ecosystem here in uh, Educate for Life, uh, and we count now over 170 amazing people. Uh, so now it's getting uh, quite a long list with a lot of skills and experiences and, uh, and, and interesting things uh, that we can share with each other. When it comes to these technologies, uh, Carla's name uh, was right there. It was flashing at me, Carlos Acevedo. And I know Carlos uh, from our uh, OpenExo um, ecosystem. And I've worked with Carlos also on a sprint in Brazil, uh, I think last year, probably it was. Uh, a very interesting sprint. And Carlos came in as a disruptor to help us disrupt the initiatives that were being worked on by the sprint teams uh, from our client. Uh, and Carlos uh, made a lasting impact on, uh, on, uh, on, on uh, my view on uh, technology and how technology can be applied and, and uh, introduce a lot of creativity and sh shared so many uh, case studies and examples I felt like I learned a ton from that day. We worked together in, in Brazil. So I was like, hey, I need to invite Carlos to come and tell <laughs> us about AI and IoT. Carlos is yeah. the man. Oh. Carlos is the man. <laughs> and, and <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm setting high expectations. Yes, and now I'm getting very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to be, certainly not. Um, and Carlos has a very interesting and rich background from AI research for companies like Samsung and now Ericsson, uh, and a, a, certainly a lot to share, uh, and a passion for uh, personal purpose and, and things that binds many of us together. So Carlos is uh, a, a wonderful uh, guy, and right now based in Stockholm in Sweden. Uh, so Carlos... Uh, give us a little bit of uh, introduction to yourself, things that I didn't say already, <laughs> that we possibly couldn't know about you. And uh, yeah. let's, let's start diving into the topic. <laughs> okay, thanks for your kind, very kind and generous words. Um, so what else can I say? I'm Brazilian. Um, yeah, I've been living in Stockholm for 11 months now, so I now got finally my very real actual experience of what a winter means because we don't have such things in Brazil. So I got to experience the dark, famous darkness in Stockholm and now I'm still recovering from, from the darkness and hopefully spring will make me feel better. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a great journey uh, working with AI and IoT. Um, I, I did a PhD in AI uh, back in 2014 it's really my passion. Um, I think artificial intelligence actually is an unfortunate name that uh, somehow uh, the people that were working with this technology picked uh, in the early 50s, 1950s. Um, I don't like very much the word artificial because it makes a distinction between uh, you know, natural 
things and synthetic or artificial stuff. And for me, intelligence is a unique phenomenon in, in the universe and in the world. It doesn't matter whether it's running in silicon-based electronics, digital world, or you know, in organic uh, biological stuff like us. So it's, it's still a mystery. Nobody knows really uh, how to formalize and to define intelligence. Um, but nevertheless, digital computation has uh, advanced quite a lot, and uh, and uh, it's one of the uh, exponential technologies that we so much care about, and uh, we can already do a lot of good stuff uh, nowadays to accelerate uh, many businesses and disrupt many uh, knowledge areas like education. And I hope that uh, whatever I can share with you today, uh, you can you can it it, it will be a starting point for you to uh, start experimenting. And uh, please don't be that much scary because I don't know how much of a background you have in AI. Um, but it's definitely not about Terminators and uh, Armageddon. Uh, it's about really merging, I would say, uh, and amplifying uh, human intelligence uh, in a way that complements us and amplifies our cognitive abilities, uh, give us new skills. Or um, it's a technology that will help us to, you know, be better in what we already do. That's the way I see um, AI uh, collaborating uh, with humans um, and changing society for, for the better. Um, yes, so I prepared a few slides for the sake of uh, a brief introduction to AI and IoT. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> and if you have any question, uh, please jump in directly, interrupt me. I'm willing also to learn from you and to uh, hear about the ideas that you're working at. And, uh, and they'll be all years and let's share experiences. Uh, let's see what will happen today. Okay. So Excellent. that will be my first time sharing the screen with this app. So let me try. Yeah. Okay. Now you can speak. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, can we see. see it now. Right. Yes. Okay. So this is a brief, oops. Oh. All right, so this is a brief intro to AI. <clears throat> so I brought some definitions. I mean, you guys work in education, so you might <laughs> uh, be interested in uh, textbook definitions, depending on <laughs> your approach to education. So one of the main textbooks in AI is written by Peter Norvig. Um, he's a research director at Google nowadays. Uh, worked as a Stanford uh, professor uh, and has a collaborator, uh, Stuart Russell from Berkeley University. So for them, they define AI as uh, the ability of, um, or, or, or the designing and building of intelligent agents that receive percepts from the environment and take actions that affect the environment. So you can say that this definition uh, conveys some sort of uh, embodied intelligence that can modify the environment and interact with with people and with the environment in, in some way that um, others might consider intelligence. Intelligence, so that doesn't help much because it leaves the definition of what intelligence is open, uh, but nevertheless, um, it's, it's, it's a good start to grasp it, what, what it's about. And then we can embody these uh, intelligent rules and algorithms and processes that uh, someone can hold using programming languages and software in, in a machine, and this machine can uh, behave intelligently, whether it's uh, manufacturing products in a better way or efficient way, where it's uh, navigating autonomously in a city uh, embedded in an autonomous car, or whether it's um, distributed in a, you know, different computer servers to go to the cloud conveying recommendations and guidance to humans or, or even educational content and interacting with students um, in, in all sorts of scenarios. So, and, and then the more pragmatic approach, uh, the, the same Peter Norvig updated his view in 2016 and uh, well, AI is just software engineering of systems that learn in a certain domains. So really, I mean, I mean, I just want you to understand that not, there's nothing fancy and mysterious about AI uh, as the current 
a technology that we use. It's, it's really about software engineering and, and, and building computer systems that, um, that captures uh, human intuition, human reasoning, and the ways that uh, humans and other animals, for that sake, uh, also learn. So there's lots of um, neuroscience uh, inspired work, biologically inspired work to understand nature, uh, to capture and mimic nature algorithmically in uh, using mathematics as well and uh, writing code that we express these vast complex uh, behaviors that, uh, you know, to make some, some machine or system to behave intelligently. So that's what AI is about. Then, um, digging deeper in this concept of software engineering systems that learn in uncertain moments. Then um, let me just uh, do a brief comment on, on what is meant by uncertain moments. So um, it's a little bit ambiguous. Um, so we, we might say that a, dom a certain domain is, is, a, is a little bit more deterministic. So for instance, in, in, in certain educational contexts like textbook contexts, a taxonomy say that uh, kids uh, is trying to learn uh, biology and all the species and, and, and how the species are categorized and in the different taxonomies and ecological niches and so on and so forth. So generally this is our standard body of knowledge that uh, most of the textbooks will agree upon. And then, uh, and then if you were writing in AI software to kind of uh, interact with the child and teach them uh, about animals and, and species, then you might want a deterministic uh, um, um, software um, that will interact with ch children, uh, meaning that uh, there will generally be a one correct answer and uh, it's easy to tell whether the child is um, far away from, from, from the correct answer or, or, or not. And so it's a, it's a, it's a better controlled envi environment because I mean, uh, the relevant knowledge to act and, in, and to interact with the children is static and, um, and, and, and then it's easier to program this kind of uh, expert-based systems. Um, but then I uh, move into uncertain uh, domains, then, then you, you, and talking a, a lot of, about IoT already, then you might imagine that we are deploying a lot of uh, video cameras and sensors to detect presence or to measure, um, you know, emotions um, uh, uh, and uh, stressors that might, uh, you know, be present in the environment. And then this conveys a notion of uncertainty because you're, you're getting all of these sensor readings and the sensor readings will vary according to what's happening in an uncontrolled environment. Are people passing by? Uh, temperature changing quite fast, uh, noise, you know, disrupting the attention levels of a classroom, let's say. And so a lot of uncontrollable factors that you can't anticipate. And then whatever intelligent software you are uh, producing has to cope with such uncertainty and has to react and, 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 and try to behave intelligently despite of all of the noise and all of the unforeseen situations. And then, and then the technical challenge to artifact uh, softwares for certain domains is, is much greater. And that's why um, there's a lot of um, state-of-the-art research, a lot of uh, you know, uh, PAD programs be, being founded uh, everywhere in the world trying to you know, uh, form the next generation researchers that will solve these, these challenges. And then there are a lot of uh, let's say supporting technology layers that um, enables AI. Um, so first there is the gathering of uh, data, uh, especially when you're talking about uh, machines that can learn and improve their own behavior from data captured by the environment. So, and, and there's the context that Internet of Things becomes relevant because Internet of Things is uh, about connecting uh, devices uh, to the internet. So it might be anything, uh, we get an IP address and, um, and now you can um, make reference to, to a cup of coffee connected to the internet and uh, measure whether it's uh, empty or, or even estimate the, the level of um, uh, the, the temperature when it's getting cold. And then you, you might use that information intelligently to either refill the cup or, or doing a lot of uh, intelligence of things. So, 
that's the, the context that IoT uh, sits in, in scenarios. So it's about uh, deploying sensors in the environment or, or um, even the notion of uh, body area sensor networks. So nowadays, smartwatches can measure heart rate beats and, uh, and uh, that can uh, you know, bring insights about stress levels as well, um, about health. Um, and then there's lots of uh, things that you can do, like eye tracking, um, so to, to estimate the attention of the user. It's very important. Eye tracking is very important, for instance, in uh, autonomous vehicle scenarios, when, when the, the, the driver is not um, you know, paying attention to, to its surroundings. So if um, there is a handover pro, uh, 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 situation where the control needs to be taken back by the human, uh, the system needs to estimate uh, if, they will, if, if the driver is really paying attention into this handover so to not cause an accident. So this is very important. How do you interact with the, with the, with the user of the system? And so IoT and sensors and uh, tracking, night tracking, and all of these are really, really important. And with the real-time processing of these data is also really, really important, especially for mission-critical use cases where there's uh, hazards that might uh, occur if you don't actuate timely uh, in a proper manner. Um, and then once you have uh, this gathering of, and, and, and of data ready, uh, then there, the next layer is the storage. How do you storage this data? So this data can be very, very complex. Uh, it can be very heterogeneous. So you can have um, uh, images, uh, videos, raw video, uh, sensor readings. Uh, you can have text. So for education, text is definitely really, really important. Uh, you might be collecting essays from the students or or even text from textbooks and trying to process this data to find patterns or to recommend, um, say, books or chapters uh, or, or reading assignments to students uh, to, you know, according to their level or to their struggles and uh, the, the, the kind of a contents that they are, they are most, that they are most needed um, given their current progress in, in a certain education context. So there is a need to store all that data uh, and prepare uh, this data for, for being processed, processed in, in the next layer. Then the next layer you have to uh, do the validation of, of this data, the cleansing. You, you have to ensure that this data is uh, of high quality and ready to be used by the actual analytics, which is where the intelligence layer becomes uh, more interesting. So analytics is about, um, it's about doing uh, number crunching, yes. So you, you, you can, you can uh, count number of words and occurrences of words. So say you're, you are processing a database of uh, essays uh, written by students um, in a certain group of schools um, in a certain region of the world. Then they want to learn uh, whether uh, the students are are having a more positive or negative view for certain content. So give them an essay topic, uh, let them use their creativity and write whatever they want to and uh, come up with conclusion. Then you can do a post hoc analysis and see um, how, how the views of uh, the students that are changing or vary uh, across classrooms and perhaps try to correlate this information with, uh, with age group or level of education or, or the, the, the uh, style of uh, the teaching style of the teachers and the lecturers. Uh, so there's lots, lots of uh, interesting uh, things that can be done uh, using analytics. So this generally employing uh, technologies that are derived from the AI domain, like pattern recognition, classification, uh, clustering, uh, so there's lots of uh, AI components that can be used there. And then the, the final layer is the, really the layer of insight and action. So here is when you start to interact with the end user of the system. So you start to generate uh, insights that are actionable. It might be recommendations to the user. So in the previous example that I gave on uh, recommending a chapter or reading assignments, you're already influencing on, on, on the educational process. And this is very serious. Uh, and then you, you might want to really uh, 
um, learn and measure uh, the consequences of and the effects of uh, how this recommendation is actually helping or improving uh, the learning experience or whether it's uh, just um, adding noise um, and interfere and uh, making the student even more confused than he or she might be. So, so here um, you all, we also have AI technologies like inference then where, where you try to really um, um, predict things and generating um, recommendations according to, to these predictions. Um, so we might predict um, a student performance on a certain test, uh, given, given the level of effort or, or the amount of time that the student spent learning uh, or doing exercise in an online learning platform. And then, and then if you can, predict a certain um, um, level of difficulty that the student might get in a test, then you can recommend some additional reading for him or her to get better prepared for test, or you might uh, change the test, um, you know, to make it more manageable and motivating so um, this student can, can get perhaps two tests, and in the first one it's a relatively easier test, and then the second one is the the real test that, you know, so there are different approaches and tweaks and hacks that you can do here uh, using this kind of a data platforms that can intelligently process uh, what's going on and how um, students and teachers are interacting um, and, and, and actuating and, recommend, and recommending actions and changing the learning experience uh, and also the teaching experience, hopefully. Um, and then going back to the AI core technology. So I talked about the enabling technologies. Um, so the different layers for gathering data, sensors, storing, storage, processing, analytics, insights. Um, but then when it comes to AI, what AI can do, uh, once you have all of these technology layers implemented, then there's really three, uh, areas that are relevant to AI. So there is the, the, the perception area uh, where you can really take care of um, and, and mimic um, you know, human and animal functions like hearing, seeing, um, monitoring, observing, uh, touching, uh, feeling, tactile technologies, haptic technologies. So hearing, um, then I'm talking about speaking, speech recognition and, and translating uh, spoken words into text that might be very useful for interacting also with, um, with an AI avatar. And I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, then there is the scene part, which is uh, uh, recognizing um, faces or human emotions or gestures or human activities of daily living. Like uh, if, if someone is uh, sit, sit, sat down or standing up or running, uh, how you know, um, a user is moving his or her body, um, and, uh, and for physical education, for instance, and for sports training, that might be really, really useful. If you really want to estimate how well uh, the student is learning um, and give recommendations, and perhaps if, if you can use millions of uh, image frames to really get the tiny details that can make the difference in sports, in high-performing uh, sports training, you perhaps work forming uh, an elite athlete, uh, you know, so that can become very relevant. Then there is the reasoning part. That's the, by far, I'd say that's the most challenging part of AI nowadays. That's the area that uh, AI researchers everywhere struggle the most, so it's the less advanced uh, area. But this is um, it's about uh, learning. So yes, machine learning is a hyped term, everybody talks about it. Um, but it's still very limited um, um, to narrow domains. So we can, you, we can train algorithms and models and machines to distinguish uh, between you know, cats and dogs and uh, to recognize a vast range of objects. Um, but sometimes it's very limited. Um, I have a question about yes, that. Sure. What's the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? I mean, can AI exist without machine learning or the opposite way? 
that's a very good question. I'd say that machine learning is definitely overlapping with AI. Um, machine learning historically, it came from statistics. So um, in early 30s, um, 1930s, uh, there were already some statisticians um, doing some machine learning work. So, but, but it was, you know, uh, <laughs> equations and, cal uh, and manual calculations. They hadn't digital computers back then to implement these uh, machine learning processes. Uh, and then AI was born in, in, in the 1950s. So I would say that the, the foundations of machine learning is uh, a little bit earlier <laughs> than AI. But after digital computers become widespread, then these two disciplines um, got merged. Statistics and uh, reasoning, logic-based uh, reasoning and other, other kinds of uh, methods to, 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 to improve uh, a software performance on a given task uh, from data. So there, there's an overlap. AI is not the same as machine learning. Uh, there's lots of machine learning that belongs to AI. That's definitely the case, but there's a lot of machine learning that doesn't need AI techniques that uh, can be uh, done with uh, standard statistics. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. And then, and then there is the, the, the action part, um, which uh, especially with autonomous vehicles and uh, robotics, uh, it's, it's getting pretty advanced. So in natural interaction, conversational agents um, like Siri, uh, Alexa, and so on and so forth, um, then it's an area that uh, there's, there has been many breakthroughs in, in this area. So I guess I guess that we do as an introduction to AI and uh, to IoT for for the moment, and then <laughs> if we can get more questions or comments, and I also have some questions for you if you if you allow me. <laughs> Who wants to go first with your questions to Palas? You can also introduce briefly your. Your sprint ideas and and ask questions into that for ideas. So I would have a question, actually uh, four, <laughs> but they're the same. They're they're um, uh, uh, merged into one issue. Uh, as I was mentioning, um, we're developing a book on social emotional regulation in uh, in children, an interactive book which will have apart from fiction, um, uh, which will have elements of. Uh, facts on three areas of three main areas of self-regulation that is uh, mindfulness self-regulation and nonviolent communication mm -hmm. and for all of these when when in, in the fact sections I, I would like to present um, a very pretty detailed um, uh, information about our brains uh, how our brains work mm -hmm. um, and my, so my question is do I start? Okay, we, we would like to start. We would like to enrich it with augmented reality. This is the worst moment to come in the room right now. Go back to your bed. Sorry. Um, so we. Uh, so is augmented reality uh, still a technology um, to think about, uh, or is it, given that you know the the, yeah, the, yeah. the speed of advancement of technology, is it something that we should think of? I don't well, know. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, augmented reality is very powerful. And, right. and I, I have an example to show you uh, about how to use augmented reality for education. <laughs> um, so let me see if you still can share, uh, if you still can see my screen. Um, yes, we still see your slide. Oh, this slide, okay. Yeah, I call technologies. So let me then change the setup. Uh, you can uh, unshare, you can stop sharing and then stop sharing. start a new share. Yeah. yeah. Then pick another one, yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah. so I definitely think that AR is a great technology for education. So this this is an example for uh, of uh, an app, AR app, from Faber Castell, uh, the German um, uh, office materials company, one of the largest uh, um, manufacturers of uh, wooden uh, pencils. 
and uh, this 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 app is in Portuguese. It was in partnership with a Brazilian startup that I got uh, to, to mentor them a little bit, and they they, they, they developed a nice app. Uh, so this is about uh, for, uh, endless forests in in English, and then if I can show you the briefly how it works, basically. Well, the main message is that um, there is a product line that they're offering in the market that's 100% made from a re reforestation, uh, kind of a cut wood. And then once the child gets the smartphone and points to a certain pencil of a given color, then a different animal will emerge, virtual animal, and start to interact with the child. And then this child can uh, ask questions or learn about this particular species. And then the main message is when you preserve forests, you're actually preserving a lot of more uh, of the biodiversity in the world and the uh, different animals that are in danger of extinction. And then it's uh, this, it's an instant, well, it's a motivation for the child to, to get to know about this uh, content. So, so I think, I think this is very useful um, uh, and a powerful motivation for, for the kids uh, to visualize, uh, you know, um, and um, the, the concrete impact. Obviously, this has obviously some marketing purposes behind. Uh, it's good for, for the branding of Faber-Castell. But nevertheless, I think it's, it's, it's very powerful. Um, and, and imagine, and when I was a mentor in this startup, they were very interested in uh, um, integrating AI to these virtual avatars. So they could have conversational agents. So the different uh, birds and elephants and uh, giraffes uh, could uh, you know, talk to the kids and they could ask effects uh, about them, about uh, when they emerged on Earth in, in, the, in the evolutionary history, how many species are still left, and uh, what are the, the, the regions in the world that is more common to, to find, find that kind of animal, each ecosystem, each climates are better suited for these animals, and what's the main threat to, to their existence, and, and so on and so forth. And I, I, think, I think by merging AI with Augmented reality, you can really get, unleash this very powerful uh, platform for, for inspiring and, and getting kids engaged. So, so this, the short answer is yes, definitely. AR, I think it's a powerful technology for education. So given that it's, uh, it's yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks a lot because, uh, yeah, my husband, when he was studying medicine, he started studying nuclear medicine, which is very promising. And right now he has to, after he finished, he graduated, it was uh, no longer <laughs> that uh, powerful. So that's, that's uh, where my question that, um, um, arises from. Thanks so much for the feedback. So uh, is, it, is it okay, given that uh, what I've seen in the Faber-Castor, it's okay to have a first uh, a successful book and then contact the AR uh, companies uh, for, for cooperation? Is it okay to have a first project product and then um, uh, contact the, the key players in the market? That's a, that's a good question. I, I, I'd say that the earlier you talk with partners, the better because they can engage with your idea and start to understand your needs and devise a plan together with you. Um, it, takes, it, it, it may take some time to, to scope an AI project because it involves a lot of uh, highly specialized uh, resources and uh, skilled, uh, skilled um, engineers um, and to plan everything that is needed, the hardware part, the, 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 the content. And uh, it's, often, it's often required a lot of involvement with the domain experts of a certain domains because an AI company will be very good at the technology, but they will be clueless about uh, the existing domain expertise of a, of a certain field. So if you're working with uh, neuroscience and uh, studying the brain and the mind, um, that's definitely some uh, missing knowledge uh, for the, the, the AI engineers. And the earlier you, you contact them, I think the better, I'd say. But of course, uh, it, it would be useful to have at least some, some, some sort of uh, idea of uh, what you want to achieve, some, some idea of a minimal viable product might be, might be good before, before uh, engaging with them. Uh, but the earlier you can do that, the better, I'd say. Okay, so the last question is, would you know the key players in the market? 
who are the, the, the key figures, the biggest fake? Yeah, so, so that's, that's a very good question. Um, AI is a very segmented uh, field. So the key players, it, it would depend a lot on, on which kind of a hardware and... Of the hardware, of the augmented reality. Oh, augmented reality, precisely, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say definitely Microsoft, the Excel in cloud computing, it, which is the uh, dominant paradigm for AI machine learning services to get started with its technology without uh, having to develop all the software from scratch. They have a lot of software already written that can be uh, used as a service for a small fee of usage. And if you can hire uh, a developer, a software engineer, uh, preferably someone who has taken some courses in AI and machine learning, um, then they, they should know how to interface with the Microsoft uh, Cloud um, to, to connect your specific software, uh, AR software, with the kind of uh, intelligence services that Microsoft offers. And Microsoft is also good because they also have some uh, AR and uh, VR products like HoloLens. Um, there's a product line of them that's uh, becoming very popular. It's a very high-end equipment and headset that's becoming very popular. IBM is also a good partner, uh, but unfortunately they do not manufacture the hardware, but they have uh, this uh, very powerful Watson uh, platform that uh, can also serve uh, some um, analytics services and insights. And I can show you an example. Um, so that might be relevant to education and uh, psychology and rings. Let me stop sharing <laughs> and share my screen again. Another window. All right. So this is this is IBM Watson personality insights. Um, it's a cloud-based service. It's a product. I'm not sure uh, how they monetize that. If you can, if you can. A contract it as a service or, or if they operate more as a consultancy basis um, I need to check that but nevertheless this is about this is about inputting a lot of uh, written text uh, so it might be blog posts um, uh, essays from students uh, or tweets and then the service will do a full-fledged analysis on the personality a profile of the user. So I can show you a demo how it works uh, based on Twitter. So we can select a Twitter celebrity like Ofra or the Pope. Um, let's try the Pope and then analyze. And then you see it's computing, this computation is happening in the cloud. Then you get an automated summary of, um, so like the Pope, you're genial, helpful, and active. So yeah, it's good to know that the Pope can be helpful. <laughs> you're empathetic. So it, <laughs> it seems that uh, he's in the right uh, position. You feel what others feel and they're compassionate towards them. So look, this, this was an, an output of an algorithm of an AI that uh, ha has no concept of what a Pope means. So the AI doesn't know a thing about Pope and of the Catholic religion, but based on the Pope uh, tweets and the, his writing style, it can infer a lot of things. Um, and, then, and then you can scroll down and uh, see the personality traits uh, likely uh, to be possessed by the Pope. Of, of course, this is not uh, scientifically accurate, of course not, but uh, it means to, to, to give some insights. And, and you, you can really see that uh, it's <laughs> for this case, it's not very good because it has a very high scores in openness, constantiation, as a weakness, inter, I mean, uh, generally, people are more kind of uh, scattered and, and not. But anyways, so this is um, what I'm talking about. So this kind of uh, AI, uh, it's offered on, uh, by, by companies like Microsoft, IBM, Google, um, and, and others. And you, you, you can contract those services for a relatively low price. And if you can hire a team of uh, engineers and developers, you can easily integrate your product with this, and then you can start generating 
recommendations or actions. Um, you, you can do a lot of stuff with these insights. Uh, but for AR, uh, I think Microsoft might be a better option because they understand about AR and VR and they do understand also about AI. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have, I have one question. So uh, we were talking in education and mainly using the online platforms as a way of teaching. And on the other side, we, within our group, we were discussing at the end it's, if it's the, the online type of environment, it's the right environment for, for learning. Uh, and we I, actually, I think we, we saw a couple of research that says that they have very low percentage of, of finishing of the courses. And I think maybe it's not so effective as a, like a in-person type of learning. So my question is, if these technologies are already used in, for example, using VR as a way of replacing the in-person type of learning, mm -hmm. and if it's already a, a case on, it's already implemented or not, if it's yeah. if, uh, on how, on, so how we can, at the end, improve the effective, effectiveness of the online uh, environment using these technologies? That's a good question. Uh, who, who asked the question? Is, is Gabriel? Yeah, it's Gabriel. Okay, okay. Yes, definitely. I think a virtual, uh, I don't know how the correct pronunciation in this, tutors uh, or teachers, virtual teachers, uh, is a very traditional area of uh, AI applications in education. So it it's definitely has been tried before. I don't have uh, any examples from the top of my mind, but I can uh, search and uh, share with you afterwards. But I do have another example of avatars, interactive avatars, um, that can be programmatically uh, tuned to interact with students and uh, perhaps make the educational content and the learning experience more engaging and rewarding from an emotional perspective as well. This is an example from, from also the IBM Watson team in partnership with the company called Unity which is the leading company for um, 3D graphics in the world. Um, so you can do 3D modeling of, uh, of uh, animated characters, of, of environments, um, computer animations. And, and in this example, it's called uh, the emotional avatar. So there is, there is an integration of uh, voice recognition services from IBM Watson. Uh, so meaning that uh, the user can talk to the avatar and the avatar can recognize uh, what the user is talking about and can react and interact with them accordingly. And another feature is that uh, depending on what the user is telling the avatar, um, it, it, it will, the system will try to estimate the, the level of emotional content. Uh, if uh, the words and the phrasings are conveying joy or sadness, fear, disgust, anger. And then you, you get to see the avatar changing um, its emotional uh, levels, emotional reactions to the interaction um, and changing its behavior uh, in an automatic fashion. So play this. I don't know if you can hear the sound of the video. No? Okay. No, no, unfortunately All right. not. But I shared the, the, the links with you afterwards so you can watch. But what's happening here is that the user is talking to the avatar. And, uh, and, and you, see, you see in the left hand, uh, bottom hand side uh, some um, phrases and sentences being recognized. And then the user is uh, conveying uh, happy phrases like, hello, avatar, how are you doing today? I'm very happy. Today is a beautiful day. And then you can see that it's becoming more joyful and uh, start running in joy. <laughs> and, and now the users are, talk, are talking about, oh, I'm not feeling good, uh, you know, uh, this day was horrible. And then you can see how the avatar becomes uh, anger or fearful and changes its behavior towards a more tentative and uh, hesitant approach and stops running. Uh, so so it's, very, it's very nice to see that um, you, you can really program um, encode intelligent behavior for, for these kind of virtual avatars. And you, and, and you can see how mixing both technologies, you can 
yes, you can implement and innovate in the educational space, virtual teachers or animated characters that can interact with the kids um, and, 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 and the kid will be more engaged and, and learn about this emotional exchange and emotional dynamics on how his or her uh, emotions affect uh, you know, the avatar and, and maybe vice versa. So the potential is huge. And, um, and as you said, Gabriel, uh, using these for, for, for better retaining uh, uh, students in, in, in an online platform and better engagement, it's really a clever idea, I'd say. It's very good, okay. very good idea. Good, 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 perfect. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Other questions from anyone? And, and by the way, this is actually, I'll share with you this link. Uh, for, for any of you who might be interested in this, or even for you, we will share this, then it's a kind of a tutorial, step by step, how to programmatically do this that I just showed you. So if you have someone skilled enough to understand technically this tutorial and follow the step by step, then you start to, to get the similar effects uh, as I showed you. So. Yep. Wonderful. I've been looking for this. I mean, mm -hmm. so it's perfect. It's perfect. Thank you very much, Carlos. You're welcome. My pleasure. It's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, it's a uh, too short time. I could talk forever and I, I'd love to hear from you. And I do have a lot of questions about education and I'd love to share some ideas with you as well. I'm sure there are more questions. Before we let Carlos go, I know, I know we're <laughs> reaching the top of the hour, but any, any last questions to Carlos? I have uh, I have one then, <clears throat> Carlos. Uh, I have a couple. I, actually, I have many, but let me just uh, limit myself to uh, <clears throat> to one or two. So, uh, uh, here here's my first question, and I want to try to understand how far we are away from building the solution I'm trying to to describe to you now. Um, so actually, I was advising a, a client uh, recently. It's an educational technology company, or, or I would say it's rather actually a company that builds uh, school books for children, but they are trying to t turn into an educational technology company. And they said, so we, uh, right now we have printed books. So what's the next level? How can technology kind of enrich that experience? <clears throat> and uh, I, I came up with an idea, right? But th there are tons of ways this is already being done. And you showed a very interesting example uh, just before. But one idea that came out of my mouth was, um, so I said, the book, the printed book, right? It holds a lot of knowledge. And Lars, as, as an avid learner, he would like to absorb all this knowledge, right? That's what he wants to do. But maybe Lars doesn't really get everything in this book. Maybe he's struggling with some mm -hmm. parts of, of the content, right? Um, so maybe Lars gives up or maybe Lars just gets stuck or whatever happens or just moves on. What if, uh, uh, let's say a facial recognition mm -hmm. algorithm uh, can spot if Lars understands what he's uh, reading mm -hmm. uh, or if he doesn't get it. If mm -hmm. I understand it, everything is fine. Uh, but if I don't get it, maybe I need the same information served or presented in a different way, which I think technology can help to do. Yeah. I need it explained in a different way. I need a different example, whatever. Technology can help in a way that a book uh, cannot if it's a printed book. H how far away are we from actually building uh, that kind of solution? Or maybe it's already out there. What well, do you for think? <laughs> First of all, it's, uh, I think it's a natural idea to have, um, definitely. Um, books need to be more interactive and with the power of internet, if you can get an hyperlink for each and every word that's there in the book 
and uh, get access to relevant content to learn more about the word or the term. Uh, and here I'm not talking about only the dictionary definition, but maybe the Wikipedia article that explains the uh, the ori origin of the term and the different meanings. And I mean, it's, it's definitely very interesting. Um, I, I think that the, there, there is a potential for AR there as well. Um, so yeah. You could have some watermarks printed in the printed book uh, if you still if you're still using that, <laughs> and then if you get a, a AR glass that's uh, comfortable enough, then um, yeah, the AR can interact with watermarkers and uh, animate some context of the book, or or maybe a virtual character could emerge from the book to give a more um, interactive explanation, or or even to kind of a play some sort of a dialogue that's happening in the book so to make it more visual um all sorts of ideas i i, I don't see that this is uh, too far away i think it's only a matter of uh, scoping the project and get the right expertise to to get it done um right. that's definitely what i what i think and and when it comes to infer the user attention uh, how much the the reader is paying attention or losing focus. This, this is already done, for instance, uh, for YouTube videos, right? Uh, you don't need to instrument uh, YouTube with sensors. Uh, YouTube doesn't need to spy you using your webcam. Um, it's just a matter to measure uh, the events when you leave the YouTube page using very old fashioned uh, web browsing technology. Uh, and uh, YouTube can tell um, the retention levels and how often users uh, quit a certain video for a certain uh, in a certain point of time um, and uh, how much the users pause the video how, how how long until they click in the play again so there's all these sorts of uh, analytics that's relatively simple to implement and can read uh, tell a lot about about user behavior and and therefore um, when properly actuated upon can enhance the user experience in watching the video. Uh, so the, 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 the um, it, it serves as a, in this case, it serves as a feedback for the content produ pro uh, producer to improve their video content, right? And the, their message to, to kind of learn how to retain more users and, and to, to make a better job in um, making an engaging, engaging videos. So in the case of printed books, of course, you, you should not expect that uh, uh, the next edition will be offered in next month, so it doesn't work that way. But if you can get some uh, real-time analytics on, on sequent events, how often the user turns the page, this, the, the, this uh, reading speed of the user, or this is more details, um, it, 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 can, it can enable, um, especially if you're using AR, it can enable some sort of interactive content to, to really help the user to understand some key talks or, or, or to slow down when, when, when there is a, uh, a, a content or a dialogue that's more intricate and requires more attention. So, well, it, it's a great idea, Lars, and, and I think it, the technology is all there. It's, it's a matter of yeah. putting the right investment and effort, definitely. Okay, so we just need to do it. Yes, <laughs> please do it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Let's build it over the weekend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. Just checking if anybody else have all the questions. I have a last one, but I, I have a question. Oh, yeah, Olga. Yes. Um, there is something that I listened in a in a talk recently, but I haven't had the chance to to research about that. In, and it's called the ethics of AI. So, can you tell me or tell us about a little bit about the concept? Yes, absolutely. Well, it's one of the hot topics in AI research, AI ethics. Uh, it's dominating all the main AI research conferences in the world, generating a lot of debate and engaging all the brightest AI minds um, in defining what it is. I say that um, it's not a new topic. It has to do with not only privacy. I think privacy is uh, one of the main issues that needs to be solved, but also um, algorithmic bias. So privacy is really important here uh, when it comes to ethical governance of AI. So if you're collecting all of these uh, data that can be used to identify the user or to profile them uh, psychologically, then this information becomes very powerful because if you understand the user psychology, you can unfortunately, uh, in principle, 
use that information to manipulate them and to cause harm to the user. So if this information is leaked or is not uh, properly protected, then, then certainly you, you run into problems and you expose your user base to, to unnecessary risks. Um, so privacy is one concern. Um, I think algorithmic bias is uh, another concern in AI ethics. So um, machine learning is a technology that uh, needs a lot of the data from users. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, lot of, lots of uh, blog posts, entries, and tweets that are public, available, etc. Uh, but when we are training uh, an AI, a machine learning algorithm to make decisions, like say uh, you are deciding whether to issue some credit, financial credit, you are banking, and uh, you are you are lending money. So based on, on the data that you get to know from the user, then there are certain data that can bias this decision uh, towards certain unprivileged populations. And, and if you don't account for that uh, beforehand, before setting up uh, the software that you uh, learn, um, you know, who is likely to pay back and who is not likely, if you don't manage this process properly from the beginning, then the algorithm will learn the bias that's already present in the data that you collect. Uh, so the data collection aspect is also very important to avoid uh, prejudices. Um, and, and, and broadly speaking, AI ethics, the, in 2017, there has been uh, the first um, 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 conference, a uh, mainstream conference, uh, where uh, one, some Top AI researchers got together in uh, California. I forgot the name of the city. I think it's Azuloma. Uh, so they devised the so-called Azuloma principles uh, for AI ethics. It's uh, 23 principles, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, ethical guidances for AI research. Um, so uh, concerns about um, value alignment, for instance. So there's one principle that says that uh, wherever AI, wherever intelligent behavior, uh, AI engineers and researchers are, are building, it has to, this behavior has to be aligned to human values, to what human, va uh, you know, um, how human behaves and what do we care about. So uh, AI explainability is another principle, so as a, a, an ethical principle, so with the GDPR uh, laws in Europe, uh, with the general data protection uh, laws in place, uh, suddenly uh, the users uh, now can request uh, from the equipment manufacturers uh, if they feel um, you know, negatively affected by a decision taken by an algorithm or by a machine, they can request uh, explanations of what was the rational justifications or explanations that led the machine or the system to do a certain kind of automated decision that affected uh, this population. So I think uh, the, the, the laws, the regulatory system are, are starting to be shaped towards um, coping with AI ethics. And, and it's a huge topic and, and there's so much left to be done. Um, and it's also a very new technology. We don't even know how this will evolve. Uh, but definitely um, the Azulomar principles uh, delineated in 2017 is uh, yeah, it's a very good start, I'd say, but the AI community needs to be needs to do much more, definitely. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. So I understand that we need to ask for certifications in order to let's say trust the information that it's coming from one of these systems. Definitely. That's, that's a, a very de de definite possible scenario. I think all the, the, the best practices uh, in, in standard practices in critical uh, industries will come to play and will be evolved and adopted by AI companies. So look at the nuclear research, how heavily regulated it is, um, and even um, airplanes uh, manufacturing. <laughs> So there's lots of uh, ISO and uh, safety uh, standards that needs the uh, you, you need to check compliance of every single process in your production line, the training of, of the workforce, um, you know, um, the, the proper inspections and the right tests, all of these have to be certified and verified. So 
so regulators can allow, even allow the companies to, to ship their products to the market. So I foresee a future where, where this will definitely happen with AI, especially when AI starts to be shipped to, to mission critical products like autonomous vehicles. I think it's about time for the uh, vehicle industry to, to, to be checked against uh, AI kind of a compliance processes. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Thank you for the good question, Olga. Yeah. And, and the answer, Carlos. Any last question from anyone <clears throat> to our Carlos? Maybe if Carlos could share some other explanations about how AI is implemented in education or examples, sorry. Not, yes. not right now. Maybe he could share in the platform Educate for a Lie. Definitely, it would be my pleasure. I Thank think there, you. there's if if you have any any sort of a more specific interest like online platforms for education, um, whatever, if you can share that with me, I can I can check for you because I have some sources and I can share uh, those with you as well. Thank you. Awesome. We'll definitely uh, do that, Carlos. <laughs> Please reach out to you with specific uh, interest areas. This will yeah. be my pleasure. I want. I badly want you to sit. I, I badly want yeah. you to change and improve education. It's, we uh, will. We the world needs it. You're you're part of the right community. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I just have uh, at least my last question for, for my side to you, Carlos. So. Um, I'm interested in road mapping on uh, initiatives where the technology is not yet there. So you need to extrapolate, you need to predict. Uh, so you have uh, the whole project coming together when the technology is also ready to start delivering. Um, and Elon Musk is uh, one of the most uh, uh, well-known people for, for doing this. Right, whether he's sending people to Mars or building hyperloops or whatever his uh, his uh, his pet project is about uh, this current month, uh, he he does specifically aim for like like it could be five or ten years out, and at this time we will have everything in place, regulation will be ready to allow mm -hmm. us to do what we try to do, technology is ready, funding is there, and we have done all our validation and experimentation and everything. So can you, do you have any thoughts or advice to share on this kind of road mapping exercise? So we, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily know how far out we need to aim. Um, the earlier, the better uh, we can launch, but uh, can, can you share some, some thoughts perhaps on, on road mapping for, for new yes. initiatives? Yeah, this is a very good and uh, very challenging question for me because I'm very used to technology road mapping. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but but then the the input and the resources that I get exposed uh, to unleash my creativity and the team's creativity is definitely cash flows, uh, market size, uh, basically, and uh, technology trends. So we look at these three different dimensions when building a technology roadmap without, generally without worrying very much about uh, regulations and um, ecosystem, um, and we let our imagination <laughs> flow free. But for more realistic endeavors, like if you really want to get, uh, to colonize Mars by 2050, yeah. You know, yeah. then you're getting very serious and uh, definitely you need to pay attention to regulations and uh, hazards and uh, ecosystem uh, suppliers uh, and everything and, and the threats and uh, you can anticipate threats and competitors and uh, roadblocks, not only techno technologically, but also um, so, so for, for Elon Musk, definitely energy uh, it's a concern uh, how to solve uh, exposure of astronauts to, radi to radiation levels that might be, you know, perma per permanently um, damage human health by the time we get to Mars. Uh, yeah. It's another issue. So there's lots of factors that can kill the projects. Um, and uh, there is this uh, strategic thinking concept of um, ident identifying scenarios and risks 
Uh, so in traditional road mapping scenario based uh, planning um, that might factor in these uh, other more intricate and complex questions like you can anticipate how the regulation will be in place, what are the threats uh, in terms of uh, competitors, what are the technology roadblocks you get uh, and then you maybe get uh, some understanding that uh, you won't be the one to get the project done by your own and alone. You need an ecosystem and then you need to develop this ecosystem if, if this ecosystem is not by into your vision. Uh, so you need to get inspired and I think Elon Musk in particular is doing a great job to inspire other companies and startups to, you know, creating this uh, ecosystem around SpaceX and around Tesla, around all of all the companies. I mean, for Tesla, he's, he has uh, opened up a lot of uh, patents early on and, and kind of uh, donated that uh, proprietary technologies for electrical vehicles uh, for free to, to, to instigate competition because he knew that uh, he couldn't do that alone. Um, and uh, in a free market, uh, innovation can thrive uh, easily. Um, you know, uh, so, so I think Elon Musk is one kind of a person and uh, he definitely is shaking uh, and is throwing away all the, the textbook knowledge of how to manage and grow a business. Um, so, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to answer your question, Lars. But this is the best that yeah. we can do. I mean, the road mapping yeah. is, is difficult, but yeah, it's it's very no, it's it's definitely a challenging exercise, which is also why I'm asking everybody I meet <laughs> at this question. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> but it's an important thing to consider, right? Uh, predict. Um, predict your project in the best possible way and the roadblocks and opportunities yes. and, and that lies ahead. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Liliana just asked if, if we can contact you, Carlos, uh, in case we want to discuss viability of our project, uh, questions like this. Yes, definitely. Um, and, and I just created a profile in this career for life, so you can, I guess yeah. you can message me there. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And uh, maybe Liliana, you can invite Carlos to your group group space and share your, your project with Carlos. Um, yes, I'll definitely do that. Excellent, excellent. And <clears throat> if others want to uh, leverage the same opportunity, uh, I highly recommend Carlos, uh, as you know. Uh, and now you know why. Uh, thank you very much, Carlos. This has been very insightful and super inspiring uh, and uh, you know obviously we could continue uh, for hours and hours it's a yes. huge topic uh, but this was meant as an introduction uh, I learned a lot and, um, and and I'm sure we're all super inspired to uh, to explore these technologies and see how they can help us to uh, to to radically change education uh, and uh, help us all in the future so that's that's thank you a lot so uh, that was also inspiring for me to get to know you and feel your energy and how serious you are and passionate you are about that so for me uh, I, I guess i'll have a good night of sleep and a drink with a better word after this <laughs> experience <laughs> <laughs> so thanks awesome <laughs> thank you carlos and thank you everyone I'll make sure to upload this recording so we Thank can you. enjoy it again. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.